what I was going to do was I was going to talk a little bit, just uh, start off with a little bit of an introduction uh, to Kaggle, talk a little bit about some of the, a couple of lessons that we've learned that we think are um, interesting and, and hopefully useful, um, then finish off uh, by talking a little bit about some of the things that we're working on that we're excited about and some of the, the future of where we're, where we're taking the company. Um, and then I'd love, uh, I don't plan to use the full hour, I'd really like, you know, we see a lot at Kaggle and I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, I'd, I'd love you to think of, think of questions or think of, think of things that, uh, that, that, you know, we might have, in, that, that are um, interesting to you that we might uh, have an interesting perspective on. So uh, certainly we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A, so please, please do think of uh, things you want to ask uh, as I go along. So just before I start, show of hands who's heard of Kaggle before. All right, so a good portion of the room, that's good. Um, uh, I was going to ask, uh, how many of you have downloaded a data set in the last year from Kaggle? Still a good proportion. Uh, how many of you have submitted to competitions in the last year? All right, nice. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to really whiz through the, the, the what is Kaggle, uh, because it seems like there's some pretty good familiar, familiarity in the room. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, just very quickly, uh, we're a platform for machine learning competitions. So what we'll do is we'll take data sets from companies, we put them up, and, and researchers, and we'll put them up on the web. Uh, and we have a community, at least the top level metric is around about 330,000 data scientists signed up to Kaggle. Um, we split data sets into two, two halves, a training data set where we give people access to the answers. Uh, no data set uh, is really this simple. Um, this is a toy example, but uh, a, a training data set where we give people the answers and we, a test data set where we withhold the answers. And so people will download the data sets and they'll upload their submissions and we score people on a, uh, on a live leaderboard based on how they're performing. Now it's incredibly, uh, it's really interesting the, the impact of putting people, uh, showing people how they're performing on a live leaderboard. It turns out to be a really strong motivator. And the, the example I like to give, so this is, this is just my favorite example because I think it, it has some, some nice, um, nice sort of story elements to it. But all, all the competitions look exactly the same. So what happens is uh, somebody makes a first entry. So this is a very, very early competition that we did uh, with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. And uh, they wanted to, as an image problem, they wanted to take uh, basically images of galaxies and measure very precisely the ellipticity of those images. And if you can do that, it turns out you can back up uh, the, the dark matter distribution of the universe. I remember being on a call with, um, with the host of this competition and he was sort of explaining the physics to us. And at one point he said, uh, oh, and this requires a simple, a simple application of, of, of general relativity, which is, which <laughs> I, I would say that's where he lost me, but he actually lost me well before that. Um, uh, anyway, the, um, so the problem was nice, nicely specified and it turned out that the first entry, a uh, very strong entry was made by a uh, glaciologist uh, called Martin O'Leary. He was at, at the time at Cambridge University and um, he, in this case, the y-axis is error, the lower the better, and the x-axis is time. And so this problem was taking, t taking, da uh, taking data from telescopes that were pointed up at, up at galaxies uh, and measuring the ellipticity. Well, it turns out that in Martin's research, what he did was he would take satellite images look, that looked down at Earth and he would measure the, the edges of glaciers. So it turns out that he was able to make a pretty quick breakthrough on this problem because uh, he, his research uh, involved doing very similar things. And he was very happy. Uh, and one of the reasons he was very happy is because uh, he'd, he had outdone about a decade's worth of, his, his, his algorithm had outdone a decade's worth of, uh, of work done by, in the astronomy community. So uh, it was actually, this, um, this blog post was put up on the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy blog. Uh, they wrote that the world's brightest physicists had been working on this problem for a while, and that in less than a week, Martin O'Leary, a PhD student in glaciology, had outperformed the state-of-the-art algorithm. I, I should have actually um, pulled out the tweet, but he was he, um, he 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 actually he got onto Twitter and he said, "Not that I'm bragging or nothing, but the White House has just compared me to Einstein and Newton." So he was very <laughs> <laughs> he was he was really very happy. There's you can see they, they explain that at the. The background of this, uh, this problem, they talk about Einstein's theory of relativity and Newton's law of gravity. So he was very happy, uh, but not for very long, because <laughs> somebody passed him, uh, and then he passed them, and they passed him, and 
you pass them, and they keep passing each other until, and those of you who have competed will have seen this effect, you get a whole lot of people sort of clustering on, um, on some level of accuracy. And what's going on is that there's a limit to how much you can get out of the data set. You get to the point where you've sort of extracted everything out of the, the data set. And it's very interesting. If you, we, we have the, um, as, you, as, you can, as you know, we have the answers on the submission files. And if you ca compare the submission files from the first, from uh, the people who are all sort of grouped at around the same score, they're typically all getting pretty much the same stuff right and the same stuff wrong. And so the, the intuition there is there's, there's signal and there's noise in a data set and you get to the point, a competition is a very powerful way to get to the point where you've really extracted all the value uh, out of a data set. Um, or you get to the limit of what's possible. Before I go on, are there any questions around anything I've spoken about so far? No. Go. Oh, sorry? Oh, who won? Um, actually, really, I said that this, this, the reason I always give this example is because it has a lot of nice, uh, yeah, nice storytelling aspects, except for the fact that the people who won ended up being particle physicists and cosmologists, not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so Martin did not end up winning, um, just despite uh, actually catalyzing a lot of, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. So one thing that's really interesting is that when somebody makes a breakthrough, almost immediately other people replicate uh, that score, and they're not—they're very rarely sh the winner. The person who makes a breakthrough is very rarely sharing uh, what actually caused that breakthrough. Um, but it's just the, the uh, just seeing what's possible makes it so. It's um, we use we like to talk about the Roger Bannister effect after the guy who first broke the four-minute mile. So you know, 19, I forget what year, 1954 around then. Um, the world record for the mile was four minutes and one second, and it had been for 10, ten years, but then Roger Bannister broke it, and, and 46 days later, John Landy outperformed him. There's something about just, you know, when somebody makes a big, big breakthrough, it makes others try, you know, it makes them no longer just tune hyperparameters, but it makes them try much more uh, bigger things. And so, you know, Martin's breakthroughs ended up catalyzing uh, good performances in other people, from other people. Question? Yeah, so typically, um, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, that's probably a good practice. Um, so it's Moritz, right? Uh, he, no, he, he, I'll, I'll come, we'll, uh, we'll discuss later. Um, so uh, the question was, um, if, if we took the first, second, third, fourth, fifth placed entries and we ensembled them together, would we get an even better score than we, than we, than we get from the individual models? It actually turns out that uh, the winners are typically ensembling. Uh, sometimes they're, they're different teams that are coming together. And so at this point, once you're at the limit of what's possible, it's really the case that ensembling doesn't make much of a difference at all. Um, yeah. Question? Yeah. You, you do see a false floor on occasions where uh, you'll, it'll plateau there, and then, um, and then you'll see another dip later. And, the way we know whether it's a false floor or a real dip is by, again, comparing the correlations between the entries from first, second, third, fourth. If the correlation is not terribly high, then we know there's still more to find in that, in that data set. Any, any other questions? All right. If not, I will continue. Okay. I'll, I'll pause at a couple of points as I go through, so um, continue asking questions. So a couple of things that we have done that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, relatively early on, uh, the Hewlett Foundation came to us with a problem around taking uh, high school essays and, tr and trying to grade them algorithmically. Um, and so we had seven, seven, different, uh, seven different essay questions. Each of them had been graded by at least two teachers and sometimes a third if there was quite a lot of disagreement between the two teachers. And the idea was to, to build an algorithm that could match the average grade of the two teachers. And this was, I think we did this in 2012 or 2013, and when the Hewlett Foundation brought us this problem, we actually thought it was probably unlikely to be possible. Um, it certainly sounded like something that, that really pushed the limit of what was possible. Uh, it turned out that if you looked at the discrepancy between the two teachers and the discrepancy between uh, either teacher and the winning algorithm, those discrepancies were about the same. 
Uh, so the, 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 you know, what we learned from that, or the surprising thing that came out of that, is it actually is, at least when you have a large number of essays to train on, or with the same question, it actually is possible to, to, um, to build an algorithm that can grade uh, high school essays. Um, so this was a particular a, a piece of work that we internally were particularly proud of. Uh, although that being said, we we did we got a lot of negative press uh, for this uh, about robo readers and, and teachers being replaced um, and things like that. In, in fact, we had one journalist who even asked us if if we could grade her uh, her article for her. <laughs> um, and then more recently, uh, we. D did some work that I think, again, internally we're very proud of uh, with the Mayo Clinic. So this was taking EEG signals and trying to predict an hour before uh, somebody had a seizure. Well, in, we actually started with dogs because um, dogs have seizures more often than human. Epileptic dogs have uh, seizures more often than humans, so it's much easier to put together a training set if you with dogs. Um, so what we were trying to do was predict an hour in advance whether or not a dog uh, was going to have a seizure. And it turned out we could predict with 82% accuracy. And then we did a follow-up uh, piece of work, again, with the, the Mayo Clinic and the University of Pennsylvania, this time using humans rather than, rather than dogs. So again, another, um, I think, you know, a lot, a lot of what we're starting to see is uh, medicine has a lot of interesting unstructured uh, data. And medical diagnosis we see as sort of a really promising uh, area for machine learning. I think, you know, like we saw with the, the essay grading, one of the big blockers is, is just the, the acceptance, societal acceptance uh, is really a, a big issue. Uh, any questions? I, might, I was going to move on and talk a little bit about some of the things that we've learned, um, but I'm happy to pause in, in case there's any, any questions before I do. So we have, Kaggle has now worked with around about 25 uh, Fortune 500 uh, companies. Um, we, as mentioned, we have a community of 320,000 data scientists uh, ranked from 1 to 320,000 based on performances in competitions. So we've seen a lot. Um, we're now at the point where uh, people are submitting about 140,000, 135,000 machine learning models to Kaggle competitions a month. So, you know, as data science is, is becoming a bigger thing, as the quality of competitions that we're launching is are becoming better, we're seeing more and more and more activity on Kaggle. Um, and, so, and, you know, we're also learning some pretty interesting lessons. Uh, one of the, one of the, the lessons that um, I think ca came through pretty early for us was the importance of feature engineering. Uh, feature engineering does, does much more to win competitions than does um, algorithms. Um, one example, Nice intuitive example that I'm going to give. It's actually not one of our competitions, but I, I like the example, so I'm going to give it. It's from um, the Netflix Prize. Has anyone heard of the Netflix Prize? Yeah, most people have. Um, so this was, for those who haven't, it was a competition run by Netflix to improve their recommendation algorithm. One of the things that, um, one of the, a pretty significant breakthrough when, 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 um, when it looked like the competition had reached a, a plateau, one of the sig significant breakthroughs was when somebody discovered that if you watch two movies in a day, you're going to rate the second movie differently to how you would have rated it if it was the first movie uh, that you had watched. Um, so, cause that's not about better algorithms. That's about sort of clever ways to think about generating features. Um, similarly, one of our competitions, uh, again, another one I like talking about because it's e easy to relate to, is around um, predicting whether a, a car sold at a second-hand auction was likely to be a good buy or a lemon. And what somebody found was, was they, um, they found that the car color had actually quite a, a big impact on whether a car was likely to be reliable or not. Uh, and in particular, what they found was that unusual color cars were more likely to be reliable uh, than standard color cars. And so what they, um, how they were able to discover this was, first of all, um, cre in doing feature engineering, well, creativity matters a lot. So you've got to be able to generate lots and lots and lots of different ideas. So dark color cars versus light color cars, maybe the assumption is that uh, dark color cars are harder to spot at night, so they're in accidents more often. Um, the unusual color cars I mentioned are red color cars because they're more likely to be sports cars. Um, th things, you know, generating lots and lots of different features, and, and not, just, not, just, not just taking the data as is, but, but uh, creating synthetic, lots of uh, interesting synthetic variables. Um, so that, that takes creativity. Then 
in order to be able to, once you've generated lots of ideas, you need to be able to test them uh, in robust ways. So good software engineering practices like version control really help you um, sort of, sort of uh, test in, in more of a scientific way and, and be able to track the results of tests that you, um, that you conduct. And then the final, um, the final thing, as far, the final important skill as far as being able to do feature engineering well is, um, is good statistical, uh, good, using good statistical methods to make sure you're not overfitting, make sure that, that you're um, cross-validating uh, appropriately, make sure that the effects that you're finding are real effects. Um, you know, we, one, of the, one of the things that we see so, so often in Kaggle competitions is that people overfit to the public leaderboard. So they'll think they're, you know, somebody will be in first place. And then we, I, I should explain this, what, what we do is we have two test data sets on Kaggle. So the representation I gave you before was a little bit of a simplified one. Actually, we have two test data sets. And we'll show people's performance on a live leaderboard, then we'll throw that, throw that leaderboard away and we'll retest people on a second uh, test data set. And if you, if you Google for overfitting, you'll see um, pro probably a bunch of people have written a blog post with a title saying something like, how I lost 400 places in one second. Uh, and what happened is, you know, the deadline for the competition ended. They were in first place, but they had overfitted to the, um, the, the public leaderboard. And so when we switched over to the, the actual leaderboard, they dropped 400 places. Um, and I tell you what, it's an incredibly effective way to learn the lesson of overfitting when you've put a lot of work in, you think you're doing incredibly well, and then, uh, and then you find that um, you haven't performed so well. Um, and interestingly, the, the frequency with which we see overfitting to the public leaderboard, which is actually sort of relatively hard, not relatively hard to do, but it's, 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 it's harder to do than if you had access to the test data set, um, makes me sort of just you know, it makes me always want to give the, le the reminder to people that when they're working with data sets where you have access to the full test data set, make sure you really are um, protecting against overfitting because it's, you know, it's, it's endemic in a situation where we think where it's actually quite hard to do and it makes me wonder just how endemic it is uh, when, when, uh, when data scientists have access to the full test data set. Question? So the reason we have two different leaderboards is because as the competition's going, going along, you're getting feedback from the public uh, leaderboard. You're getting feedback from the public leaderboard. Um, and so what happens is you're, just say you're, you've, you're getting 85% correct. So it's misclassification error is the objective, uh, is, the, is the metric. Um, what, you, what you might do is just say you're in first place. Uh, you might just tune your, just sort of tune your hyperparameters and just Try and get from 85 to 86 to 87. Just optimize for pushing up that score. And what you're really doing is you're not you're creating a um, an algorithm that works very well just for that leaderboard data set, but doesn't generalize well, which is not terribly useful. Any any other questions? I would actually say, so the question was, how often does it happen that the person who was leading the competition doesn't end up winning? Um, unfortunately, well, as our competition is becoming more and more and more popular, um, the, as our competitions are becoming more and more, more and more popular, we have more and more, more and more people entering them. And so what ends up happening is very often the difference between first, second, third, and fourth is not statistically significant. And so it actually ends up being a lottery whether you end up finishing first or uh, fifth. So the, um, it, it's, it's actually becoming more, yeah, it's becoming more of an issue just as, as Kaggle becomes more popular. One thing I will say is that um, uh, Stephen, who just asked the question, his daughter is responsible for the number of competitions that we uh, post on Kaggle. So I think if, um, uh, to the extent that um, uh, we, we are working to address this, this problem. Uh, so we will uh, have, have a wider spread of competitions, uh, hopefully over the, over the next six months, so that we don't have you know, 3,000 entrants per competition and it isn't a lottery as to who wins. Question in the back. Can you repeat the question? Do you mind repeating the question? Um, 
I mean, cross-validation, so the question was, uh, uh, what are the regularization techniques that people are using in order to make sure that they don't overfit? So um, cross-validation is sort of an, uh, one that's applicable across all uh, techniques, and if done well, that, that should get you most of, the way to, most of the way to where you need to be to prevent against overfitting. He's saying, what sort, of, what sort of problems is it possible to get higher accuracy and what sort of problems is it? Um, sorry, do you mind repeating this? Right. Yeah, so there are, there are, so the question was, there are some problems that machine learning does a good job of and some, um, some problems that machine learning doesn't do a good job of. Um, and I actually think it's, so we, I'll give you some examples. I don't know that I'm yet in the position where, so because of the fact that people get to the limit of what's possible on a data set, um, uh, we, we sort of have a good data set as to, you know, what machine learning can do well and what machine learning can't do well. Um, I don't know that we've really sort of synthesized uh, systematic learnings uh, that we, we can share back. One thing we can say is that, you know, there's a lot of excitement around convolutional neural networks or deep learning at the moment, that really is leading to, that really is winning competitions and improving what you can do with images and, and um, natural language processing. So that has improved the, you know, the, the, the what's possible uh, with those sorts of problems. Um, you know, we, we've had problems where we've literally not been able to make any progress whatsoever. So one was taking Twitter data and trying to, trying to um, figure out somebody's personality from their tweets, uh, you know, whether they're psychopathic or whether they're narcissistic. <laughs> or, uh, it, it turns out that we, we got no zero signal out of that uh, data set. Um, on the flip side, we had a, a problem which sounded like a pretty hard problem to take um, basically sound recordings from the ocean and figure out, try and detect different types of whales. And actually that was possible with 100% accuracy. So. Um, just giving you sort of the range of something that turned out to be impossible and something that turned out to be, well, totally 100% doable correctly. Yeah, it's a great question. So have we tried to take a problem uh, from two years ago and rerunning it today and see whether the, the limit um, changes? We have not. It's a really nice idea, particularly in some of the areas where we've seen uh, deep learning really make a difference. Yeah, it's a nice, nice experiment. Um, so, say that again, sorry? Yeah, so the question was, is it, is it sometimes the case uh, that the model that ends up winning a competition ends up being very complex and doesn't end up getting deployed? Um, so this was what happened with the Netflix prize, uh, where they ran it for two years, and the winning solution was was, it was an ensemble of seven or eight hundred different models. And it turned out if you took three three of those models, you get got to about sort of ninety eight percent of the score that the seven hundred models got you to. The way the way we try and protect against that is we don't run competitions for two years for starters, because then the incentive is just to layer. So model on top of model on top of model. Um, the other thing we do is we try and award prize money to the top five. So that this is this comes back to the question Stephen asked before about you know is it sometimes the case because we have uh, this issue of the winner sometimes being a lottery. It's fairer when you award prize money to the top five. But the side effect of doing that is that you also end up uh, the co company that hosts the competition gets all the models. Um, gets all the models that they pay prize money for. So they get a selection, and one might be more easily implementable. And so that's how we get around that issue. Yeah. Question at the back. Yeah, certainly becoming a bit more like that with some of the competitions that require deep learning or convolutional neural networks. So what's, typ what's often happening for those competitions is people are doing most of the work on their own machines, and then they'll go the last mile on you know, the Amazon EC2 um, which give you GP, GPU instances, for instance. Um, so that, that's something we're seeing a little bit more of. Question. Uh, 
Um, so the question was, we must have turned away some, um, some problems uh, as competitions. Um, I think the, generally to the extent that we turn away problems, it's really because they're not well enough specified. So um, very often we have uh, a lot of inbound from you know, uh, companies that want to get started in data science, but we're actually a relatively more advanced solution. So we end up, you don't Google very, you don't have to wait, you don't have to spend too much time Googling before you land on Kaggle. And so if you're sort of trying to get started in, with data science as a company, you probably come across us, but we're probably not the right fit. So I'd say we, we turn away, the vast majority of the problems we turn away are because, um, or, 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 um, or just the amount of work to get it to a specified problem is just a lot of work, a well-specified problem, which actually, um, actually goes uh, well towards the next thing I was going to talk about. So I might, I might pause on questions for a little bit and just talk a little bit more about one of the things that we're, some of the, another lesson, another key lesson at Kaggle and one of the things we're working on as a result. So, you know, we, what we found is um, Kaggle is really, competitions are a really good solution for um, this part of the, the machine learning pipeline, except data science involves a lot more. So uh, you start off, you've got to set up your environment, extract data, load your data, explore the problem, uh, clean the data, and so on and so forth. There's actually, um, I don't know if anyone follows the Big Data Borat Twitter handle, but he has this quote that data science is 80% cleaning the data and 20% complaining about cleaning the data. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So what we had developed internally was we developed some collaboration tooling that made it much easier for our team internally to the extent that we're consulting with customers and helping them get their, their problems in shape, made it easier to build off what they had done uh, previously um, and meant that we were able to massively condense down the amount of grunt work that we were doing internally. Um, and this, this has a couple of effects. Firstly, it makes data science more enjoyable to do, doing less uh, repeating of data cleaning steps that have been done before. Uh, but it also made our team a lot more productive. And so one thing we've, we've started doing is we started actually releasing this collaboration tooling uh, into, into Kaggle for people to use uh, alongside their competitions. Um, and I'll show you what this looks like in a minute. But the idea here is that if you're, yeah, if you're competing, uh, at the moment it's, it's, it's really aimed at sort of fostering collaboration. One of the key motivations for people uh, coming to Kaggle and spending as much time on Kaggle is actually not to win uh, in a lot of cases, but to to learn. Um, and so we, we've started off by launching this collaboration tooling into, uh, into Kaggle.com where anything that it's used for is shared publicly. But we will have, you know, just like GitHub, we will have uh, more private versions as well. So I'm going to attempt to show you a live demo. So for anyone who hasn't been to Kaggle, Kaggle before, this is what the website looks like. One, um, one type of competition we have is a getting started competition. I'm going to show you a show, show of hands who's seen the MNIST data set before. It's a very common first data set for, for people to try uh, when they're doing machine learning. I've, I've asked that question before, and I've, I have been given the answer that not only do I know the MNIST data set, but I, I can actually tell you which individual digits are very hard to classify. Uh, so the MNIST data set, for those who don't know, is, is a handwriting recognition data set. Very, very typically used to benchmark uh, new machine learning algorithms. And we use it, uh, as I said, as a getting started competition um, just to get um, people in and, and playing with Kaggle. And, it, and uh, if you want to be cynical, uh, to get people addicted to Kaggle and then uh, working on some of the other competitions. Um, so one thing that we have on Kaggle that's really incredibly, um, incredibly uh, popular feature of the site are our forums. And what we've noticed is that a lot of people in our forums will share code. So if you want to get PengPay's uh, convolutional neural network code running, you've got to install Pandas, Scikit-learn, Matplotlib, NumPy, NoLearn, and Lasagna. So you, you've got to have the same uh, version of Python. So he might be using 3.4 and you've got 2.7. There's a whole lot of frictions uh, in downloading his code, getting it running in your environment with that data set, um, and so on and so forth. So what we launched really only a couple of months ago, is we launched a tool called Scripps. And so what you can do is you, you might have noticed Scripps is a link just under forums. And when you go into new script, 
you can choose an R Python Julia or R Markdown environment. The data is automatically read in, and you can immediately start coding. And when you hit the Run button, uh, it will run inside a Docker container uh, on our servers. Now, as I mentioned, anything you use the scripts tool for is shared publicly. And so for any competition that's running now, you can see, or most competitions, I should say, you can see what the highest voted scripts are. So you can see on the right-hand side, you've got the, the number of votes. Um, you can also see what language it was written in. So in this case, it's Python. You can see how many forks, how many views. So I'm going to show you um, one of the ones that I really like. It's written by one of my colleagues. So it's a, it's a random forest. And what he's doing is he's classifying the, uh, the di digits using a random forest. And then he's plotting the proximity of the, the digits on an xy plot. So you can see here, the nines are really close to each other. The sevens are close to each other. The fours are close to each other. You can see that the nines and the sevens are near each other. The fours and the nines are near each other. So it's, it's working as you might expect. Um, the other thing you might notice is that he's consistently getting wrong. The, the ones in bright red are the ones he's getting wrong. So he's consistently getting wrong the sevens with the dashes through them. That one. And this one is probably being mistaken for a nine. You can see how it's grouped near the nines. So if I want to improve on this, I can just hit the fork button. And what it does is it forks the Docker container. So you have the same environment that he's working in. You have the, uh, it, it forks the code and it forks the connection to the data. So it gives you an environment immediately that you can sort of take his code and start working in. Um, so we've seen all sorts of interesting things. We have a, an overall scripts page which shows you all the scripts that have been run across all the competitions. I'm just showing you the highest voted. So not terribly surprising. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the scripts that help you get really good scores in competitions are forked many, many times uh, and also upvoted many, many times. Um, so Abhishek is, I think, our number three or number four ranked user. Yeah, question? That's exactly right, yeah. So it's an, it's an environment, it's basically an online environment to execute code against the data sets without, sorry? Yep. Um, so for the time being, you can't customize your own. We will release, we're adding functionality to this really, really quickly. For the moment, um, you can't, you can only run the, uh, with the libraries that we have installed. But we have all the libraries you could, well, anything non-mainstream, sorry, anything mainstream that you could possibly want. And actually, one of the interesting things about scripts, one of the most popular uses, you'll see that the fourth most upvoted script is this person uh, demonstrating the XG boost model, which is an implementation of gradient boosting machines. So uh, this person, I think it's Tian Key from memory. Um, has is oh no sorry it's somebody else. Um, this person is the creator of the XG Boost library, and they want to promote this library, and so it's a really good way for them to um, yeah it's a really good way for them to sort of give people the opportunity to play with their new library and get adoption for their new library. Um, and so what people like that will typically do is they'll write to us and they'll say, I want to create a script. Can you add my library uh, to your environment? So we're constantly adding new libraries. Actually, one of, the, one of the most popular uses for the scripts tool is exactly that. So at the moment, there's about four or five packages that are competing to be the, the uh, scikit-learn of, of deep learning. There's uh, Keras, uh, Lasagna, Neon, a, 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 a bunch of them. And you'll notice that all the... If you scroll down the list, you'll notice here's the lasagna one. Um, I think there's Keras. There you go. Keras, uh, De uh, DeepNet starter code. So Francois Cholet is the creator of the Keras package. He uses Kaggle scripts um, partly just to, 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 yeah, he wants to be the scikit learn of, um, you know, he can be the scikit learn of, uh, of, um, of uh, deep learning, and it's a really good way for people to be able to play with with Francoise's code. Where's that? 
Ah, uh, yeah, right, right. We've got mixed results. Some people are very happy. So the question was, what are the, uh, cor correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but what are the so social dynamics around frolking? Um, so we're getting, um, we're getting uh, two sets of results. Some people are delighted. So it's a, a lot of the people who spend time on Kaggle really to learn, which is probably the majority of our user base, are really happy. Um, it's a phenomenal um, learning opportunity. It's a very easy way to get into somebody else's code. Um, again, if you want to play with Keras, there's no easier way to do it. Um, on the flip side, we are getting people who are somewhat annoyed when, say, Abhishek, for instance, uh, posts code that will get you a very, very high score on the leaderboard. So you can see here that Abhishek's code gets you a 0.57. If, you, um, if, you were, if your score was a 0.56, you suddenly have 136 people ahead of you. So that's the, that's the one issue we've had uh, in launching scripts. On balance, we think it's a, it's a, oh, sorry to show you this quickly. So you can actually submit to a competition directly from, from scripts. You don't actually have to download the data. But on balance, we think it's healthy for, notwithstanding the fact that we are getting some pushback from, from, um, from people who, who thinks it blunts the, the, the competitiveness of competi competitions. What we find is that the best script, the scripts typically get you to a certain point, but they're not getting you to you know, a top 20 finish. Um, and, uh, and on balance, we think it's a positive thing for the site. Question? Yeah, so it's, a, it's in a, uh, we're running them in containers, so they're sort of secure. You're worried about, you're, you're asking the question about running arbitrary code on our servers and what yeah. the impacts. Well, not just that. Because it's not just that you're running arbitrary code on the Docker, or I upload my own Docker containers? No, they're our Docker containers. Okay. Yeah. They're not arbitrary Docker containers. Not yet. We want the, we do want to allow people to customize their Docker containers, but we're not there yet. Uh, no, so we're, we're actually a little atraditional for the Bay Area. We're, we run on Microsoft Azure, but the same as AWS. Oh. Um, what people have said that it's been a powerful way for them to get into competitions faster. I don't know that we've, we've only been going for two months. We haven't run that many competitions in that two month period. So um, I don't, it's too early. It's, it probably is making a difference, but it's too early for us to have, be able to measure it. Any other questions? At the back. Yeah. So is the question is, are we facilitating, is the idea? Yeah. So the question is, um, is this intended more just to facilitate learning, or is this meant to be uh, a more powerful instance than people have access to on their local machines. So at the moment, it's just the, for the former. It's only a learning tool. We limit you to a certain amount of memory. and We learn limit you to, I think, 10 minutes worth of execution time. So um, it's not a, it's not, it, it's not what you, you could buy a much bigger instance from Amazon or um, potentially even have a bigger machine uh, locally. And actually, we, we've sort of done that for a reason. One of the reasons is we, we will allow people to, as I said, arbitrary Docker instances, larger, larger virtual machines. We will support all of that. Um, the reason we haven't started with it is we want to see people using it because the tooling is good and it's nice to use and, and it facilitates learning, not just because we're giving you a free way to execute very large code. 
uh, or, or giving you more compute than you might otherwise get. I think what we'll start to do is to the extent we're giving people access to more compute, people will pay, you'll pay for the, we'll give you a certain amount for free and then you'll pay for um, additional compute. The idea is also that we'll make this available once, we, you know, at the moment it's a pretty new product. You can only use it in a cloud-based IDE. We haven't, we haven't integrated Jupyter Notebooks yet. Uh, this is something that is under very active development. And once we get it to a point where it's, it's really, um, it's really uh, a bit, quite a bit further along than it is, we'll allow people to bring their own data sets, uh, which you can either share publicly and share your analysis publicly, um, or, or uh, potentially just share with uh, people you're collaborating with. And the idea is that your Kaggle profile, you can store, just like your GitHub profile, you can store a lot more of the data science that you're doing not just competitions. Question? Yeah. So is execution time an issue for competition hosts? Yeah, um, so what's typically the case is like the Netflix prize example I gave where it was 700 models ensembled and you could shrink them down to three and you got pretty much the same level of accuracy. That's typically the case with um, the winning solution. So we, we have tended not to give restrictions on execution time, um, but rather what, what will typically happen at the end of a competition is there'll be some consulting between the winning team and the competition host. And so you can pair the model back and get it to fit within the requirements of a customer. And we found that we found keeping the, the objective function for competitions to be simpler, to be a, a better, more, um, more engaging way uh, to run competitions. I think certainly now that we have scripts, it, it uh, increases the range of options that we have as far as standard, you know, requiring you know, execution time is hard to um, insist on or it's hard to have execution time thresholds when everybody's using different hardware. But if everyone's running on the same hardware, that becomes easier to police. Um, but it, it hasn't been a big, you can typically take whatever algorithm wins and strip it down and, and not really sacrifice very much in performance. So it typically isn't such a big issue. How are we doing for time? Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, we, we actually don't. One thing that we're, we have been um, probably a little bit slow on and we, we do want to do more of is make more of our data, the metadata or the more of our database public. Um, you know, Stack Exchange do a really nice job of this. They have a, a tool called SQL Explorer where you can query all the Stack Exchange data. And we'd actually like to make it all, all available through scripts eventually so that you can, you can either query it using SQL queries or you can, uh, you can play with it using R and Python. Because um, you know, there's probably a lot of interesting learnings that we as a team just haven't had the time to chase down. And making that data available I think would be um, interesting. So that would allow you to answer questions you know, like the kind of questions that you're wondering about. Yeah. I think there was a question just in front. Yeah, so um, uh, I guess the, the question is, um, how do we judge accuracy? Uh, it's obvious for a binary classification problem, but what about for um, regression, for instance? Um, the answer to that is we have about 30 or so metrics built into our software. Um, and so actually, even in the case of binary classification, we don't always, we actually rarely use misclassification error, which is the percentage correct and the percentage incorrect. We'll typically use things like area under the receiver operator, the ROC curve. Um, uh, but we have, we have, yeah, we have, I think, about 30 um, metrics uh, uh, built into our, um, our competition wizard that a competition host can select from. And actually, we, we've been meaning for a long time to open source these metrics because if you think about it, that our metrics code is pounded on more than probably just about anybody else's metrics code. So there are often edge cases uh, that metrics code doesn't necessarily deal well with because our metrics are so heavily pounded on, they're sort of a good gold standard. Um, 
So we keep intending to uh, open source them. I, I don't believe we have yet, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a lot of things coming. Question? Yeah, we like probably will be. And for, for companies that are just doing something here, like uh, trying to find out what's going on in the world, it's like, have we done as well as we could? How do we know, you know, if this is going well? Can we actually like run out the model? So yeah, that it's, that a, it's a really nice idea. It's related to the question uh, back there. You know, with some machine learning problems are easier and some are harder, and, and what works well and what doesn't. Um, we've run, I think we, we run about, at the moment, we're running about 50 kind of normal competitions a year, and then we have we have a product called Kaggle in class where professors host competitions for their students. I think we run about 150 or 200 of those a year. So overall, we've run probably around about 600 competitions. Um, I'm not sure. So we probably do have a, enough of a data set to be able to at least do something um, where the feature is the data set and, and the target variable is the level level of accuracy. Um, I don't know, yeah, it, it's something we can, I, I think there are lots of interesting, um, both practical and questions of practical interest and research uh, interests that we'll, we'll be able to be answered when we do finally get around to releasing our data set publicly. Question? Yeah, you know, I had always hoped initially that um, we would get to the point where companies could put, uh, where um, data science would become like like a sport and the best data scientists would get paid equivalent to what the best golfers uh, get paid. Um, that was always sort of a nice idea. I think that um, that ends up being quite difficult. So first of all, um, we have to spend a lot of time, it, companies can't, aren't onboarding competitions at a high enough volume in order to sort of really push up the prices. Um, so really, the motivation for uh, people to compete on Kaggle is actually much less about prize money uh, than it is about, uh, it's, it's really, it's mostly learning. Uh, so people, people it's, prize money is seen as a bonus. Uh, the way it was put to me is Kaggle is, prize money is, people like higher prize money competitions not because they expect to win, but because it's like high stakes poker. It, there's so, so, sort of something more at the end of it. Um, so, you know, it, it, it would be nice to get to the point where um, people could make a real living on Kaggle, but I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's not the motivation for, for, um, for, it's not the main motivation, it's really to learn. And it's, you know, if you're a beginning data scientist, it's a great way to sort of get exposure to uh, problems and data sets and, and solutions and forum discussion. And if you're an advanced data scientist, you know, you can try out and you can try out all sorts of things that are really pushing the, the cutting edge of machine learning. Uh, question? Yep. So um, Kaggle has a few, uh, we have a few uh, uh, drivers of revenue. Um, one is, um, so really people host competitions for three reasons. One is um, uh, getting to the limit of what's possible on a data set, typically a very hard problem. Uh, the second is recruiting. So Walmart and Facebook and, and companies like that will post problems and they'll interview the top 20 or 30. And the third is um, promotional, uh, promotional type, um, type things. Like if you're FICO, for instance, we have a deal with FICO where they'll host a certain number of competitions a year in order to promote to uh, our user base. Um, the other thing we have is a jobs board. So we charge for all of those things. Um, sort of further out where, um, you know, one, we think that there's, um, there's a good commercial, as well as being a good learning tool, we think there's a good commercial opportunity around scripts. So making it much easier. As, as I said, we, this is, there's a long way to go on this product, and so we're not charging for, we're certainly not charging for it for public use, but we do believe that it solves one of the biggest pain points that data scientists have, which is the ability to collaborate and 
we believe we will get to a product that is feature rich enough that data scientists will, um, will want to use and, and those in companies will want to pay for. Um, yeah, we're limited by the, we have to help competition hosts on board. They're, the question was, is there a limit to how many competitions we can run a year? We have to help competition hosts on board their competition. Um, and so we have uh, two data scientists internally who consult with customers to get their problems into the right shape. And so we're limited by, um, I guess, the number of problems that are, that are sort of close enough that we can hand them to our data scientists and then the number that they can uh, put on. Um, at the moment, we have many more data scientists than we have. Like the, the number of comp, uh, competitors per data per competition is sort of increasing as Kaggle becomes more and more popular. So we are trying to increase uh, the, the the throughput and the number of competitions that we launch. Is there a really large competition? Yeah, there is. I think the the challenge is getting them into a, a the question into a form where they're easy enough to where where you can load them onto Kaggle. Question at the back. Yeah, so the question was um, the distinction between elegant and Ill elegant solutions. Um, you know, one nice thing about, again, scripts, which, as you can tell, I'm excited about, I talk about it a lot, um, is um, whenever people share code, you'd be amazed at how much cleaner it is than code that is not, <laughs> <laughs> that is not shared. Um, so um, what, we're, what we're seeing, so the, actually the quality of the code in scripts is typically pretty nice, whereas um, the quality of code that gets handed over at the end of, a, end of a competition, if it's not forced to run through a tool where it's being publicly displayed, is, is much lower quality. Um, and so one thing we're toying a little bit with is the idea of asking all competition winners to run their, have their code go up on scripts, at least to the extent that a competition host will allow. Uh, and I think that knowledge will, will push, uh, people, push people to refactor and, and to write native code. Uh, question at the Yeah. Sorry, can you, I didn't quite catch the question. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I guess our competition hosts ever disappointed because uh, solutions end up being simple. I think there's probably more often the opposite disappointment, which is that solutions are more complex. Um, um, actually, I think the, a bigger source of disappointment for competition hosts, which happens very, happened a lot in the very early days I was onboarding competitions. It happened more when I was doing them than, than now. Uh, but leakage in, uh, in data sets where you put up a, you'd be amazed at the forms of leakage uh, that are possible in a data set. So anytime, we, we, we always, we have a big checklist of things um, that we check for whenever we get a new data set. One example is, um, well, an obvious one, mapping row number against the target variable, you'd be amazed at how often when you get a data set from a customer and you, you correlate row number to, to the target variable, how, how often there is a correlation. So we have a, a lot of things that we check for in order to try and limit the number of competitions where leakage is an issue. And you, if you've been a long-term Kaggler, you'll notice that it's nowadays relatively rare that you see leakage, whereas in the early days it was a, it was a pretty acute problem. That's actually another thing we should probably release in a blog post is sort of all the checks we go through uh, to make sure to, to make sure our data sets in good shape. You know, one um, one, one of my colleagues uh, gave a talk recently at a at a machine learning meetup in in Mountain View, and she said um, she asked the question, "How many of you have a thousand or two thousand people looking at your work?" Well, I do. Uh, so, you know, any time she puts out a data set, she, uh, she you know, she knows it's going to be pounded on and, and it has to be pretty, pretty carefully checked beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, I think I mentioned the main one, the, the deep, deep, deep learning and convolutional neural networks. Like a lot of things, it's been overhyped, but it is a real thing. Um, and, you know, for anyone who wants to play with them, 
you know, we have a phenomenal, we have a really nice library of um, of deep learning and convolutional neural networks code that you can play with. Um, so that's pr that's the main one, one that comes to mind. It's not very surprising. Um, trying to think of something more surprising. I I, I think that's, yeah. Uh, question. So uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you had said that uh, somebody tried to allow you like. Right. Yeah. So the the question is, um, uh, we want to get all the winning competition models in scripts, but is that going to annoy customers who have paid prize money in order for a license to the winning code? We have uh, different licensing requirements. We have different pricing tiers. So the most expensive competitions we run are only open to people of the master's rank. And if you run that comp a competition at that price point, you get an absolute license over the winning algorithm, and that's not going to right, that's not going to go in scripts. On the other hand, we've done things with Wikipedia, for instance, and they wanted the algorithm to be open sourced. And so, in those situations, uh, absolutely, it's fine to put something into scripts. Um, the um, I guess the the most common case is a non-exclusive license is granted to the um, to the to the customer. Um, in that case, we we sort of ask we'll ask permission on a case by case basis. Yeah. So, and that's more a courtesy than it is something that we're legally obliged to do. So, okay, I'll take uh, two more questions. Is that all right? Yep. All right. All right. Yeah, so the question was, we sometimes anonymize data sets before we put them up online. To what extent when we anonymize the data set is information lost? I would say that um, it's really very, con it's definitely the case that information is lost and it's very context dependent uh, as to how much information is lost. Um, we always encourage, uh, to the extent possible, not to anonymize, not to anonymize data sets because or anonymize them as little as possible because it definitely degrades the information content. And if you don't share the, uh, if you don't share information on the rows, it makes it harder for people to be creative with feature engineering. So um, I, it's hard for me to give a general answer, uh, but there is always information loss, or there is typically a, information loss the more heavily you anonymize the data set. I'm gonna take one more question. Yeah, so we did uh, quite a lot of work in, um, in energy, specifically in oil and gas. Uh, we worked, Shell was the first, uh, our first oil and gas customer, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to optimize the performance of their, uh, of their wells based on things like, you know, how much fluid they're injecting and um, all their different engineering parameters. Um, we, we'd worked with, so it turns out that there's a lot you can do. So, a lot of data science at the moment is focused on uh, things like, you know, Google predicting you know, what ads you're going to click on and Facebook what, what you want to see in your newsfeed. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be done in the, the physical world as well that's really um, an untapped opportunity. And we started working a lot um, in oil and gas with the idea that we would sort of branch out and do more in other industries as well, that where a lot of these techniques had not yet been uh, penetrated. Um, and I think there are, um, we, we ended up hitting, we ended up, uh, uh, ended up um, shutting that business mostly, mostly just because of the oil price um, and also because a uh, more sensible direction for us to go was more around the collaboration tooling. It's sort of a better fit with our community and, and so that's, that's really where the emphasis is for us at the moment and sort of the next wave of growth for us is really around scripts and the collaboration tooling. I'll take one more question, and then anyone can feel free to come up and chat afterwards. Question. Yeah. Yeah, I like the essay grading. It's one of the one, one of the ones. It's not a complete success story yet, but it's on the way. So it's been actually been deployed in in a couple of schools. Uh, it's taking a long time. I think we did the work in in 2012. Um, but it's, um, uh, it, it is actually sort of slowly uh, making its way into schools. Um, another one that we're doing at the moment, which I think is going to turn into a fabulous success story, is around taking images of the eye and diagnosing an eye disease called diabetic retinopathy. 
Um, so this is so the idea of diabetic retinopathy is a is an eye disease that many many diabetics suffer from, and if you can detect it early, it's eminently treatable. Uh, but there's a shortage of there's a shortage of of uh, folk who have the ability to diagnose this eye disease, and so the Californian Healthcare Foundation are running a competition at the moment to take images of the eye and see whether you can actually diagnose uh, algorithmically. And like with the essay grading, um, we're at the point where we're matching uh, human performance. So this is one. The essay grading is a historical, and the, the, the diabetic retinopathy is one that I think is going to end up um, making its way into the field and, and really having an impact. All right. Um, so we might end it there. And anyone who wants to continue chatting, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hang around. <laughs>